If you're going to read one book on relationships, do yourself a favor and skip the self-help books all with all the how-to books and look into something a little deeper. There's no better guide into this thorny realm than the Jungian analyst James Hollis. Hollis wrote a little book in the 1990s called The Eden Project, which will pretty well turn everything you know about relating to others on its head. Hollis begins the book with the image of a male cardinal that appears two to four times a day at the window of his consulting room and repeatedly bangs himself into the window. Now, Hollis finds an explanation for this behavior which he feels resonant, whether it be true or not. He's told that the cardinal has lost his mate and believes he has just seen her in the reflection of that window. With unbounded joy, he flies to her and is stunned over and over again. Hollis had seen his mate and their brood two years previously and has seen them no more, so this theory of loss haunts him. From the cardinal, we move on inside to the heart of the book and to what Hollis really wants to tell you. And I think many won't like it. In fact, I once had a friend say they wanted to throw the book across the room. But if you really want to shape up in this area of your life, you need to listen to him. This is a book that requires periodic rereading as you adjust and grow in and out of relationships. Now, Hollis makes it clear from the beginning that this book is no practical guide to fix a relationship. Its intention is to provoke thought and response, and to serve as a sort of corrective to the generalized fantasies about relationships that permeate our culture. He wishes to inspire a desire for personal growth as opposed to the fantasy of rescue through others. And what fantasies, as Hollis points out, we are surrounded by them, on screen, especially in the many romantic comedies that Hollywood spews out, and in commercials, and even in talk shows, as therapists are invited to fix a relationship, and participants are asked to fill in bland questionnaires that will take them no closer to their goal. The message in the Eden Project is best summarized by Shams Tabrizi, who is the Persian poet Rumi's spiritual teacher, and who said, the summary of the advice of all prophets is this, find yourself a mirror. If there is a single idea which permeates this book, it is that the quality of all of our relationships is a direct function of our relationship to ourselves. Now here's the problem. We are guided by the things we do not see in ourselves, things that reside deep in our unconscious. As Hollis puts it, we need to acknowledge that the character of all our relationships arises out of our first relationships, which we internalized and experienced as an unconscious, phenomenological relationship to ourselves as well. Out of that relationship comes the depth, tenor, and agenda of all others. Now, since much of our relationship to ourselves operates at an unconscious level, most of the drama and dynamics of our relationship to others is expressive of our own personal psychology. So the best thing we can do for our relationship with others is to render our relationship to ourselves more conscious. Well, of course, this sounds easy, but it's clearly not. It is the work of a lifetime, in fact. And though hard, it is the most exciting project of all. Although the larger self is unknowable, we can perhaps glean its intention, Hollis suggests, through body, affect, cognition, symptom, dream image, and the like. In Greek tragedy, one feels the earth shudder when a protagonist claims complete self-knowledge. At that moment, one is certain that the gods begin their work to stun the person back to the proper humility of Socratic questioning. This is why the works of classical Greece are so powerful. They hit you right between the eyes. So how we read our ego selves with respect to others begins at birth. The child experiences bonding or a lack of it as a statement about the world at large. Is it reliable? Is it protective? Or is it unpredictable, even hurtful? Hollis says we have wounds and the clusters of energy that accompany them because we have a life history. The deeper question is whether we have the wounds or they have us. These wounds that we have are created when we are very young, Hollis reminds us, and the boundaries of the very young psyche are very permeable and the child is at the mercy of powerful outside forces. As Carl Jung himself said, parents should always be conscious of the fact that they themselves are the principal cause of neurosis in their children. 
So what is to be done? We need courage, Hollis says, courage to look within and own what we find. Jung himself kept looking inside and finding that he was coming up short. He kept finding things that he did not know about himself. This is a repeated humbling of the ego, but a necessary one. Jung also observed that the most profound encounters with our deeper self are usually experienced as defeats for the ego. That is the only way consciousness can enlarge. Ego thinks it is all, but is you actually composed of many voices and directives, often at war with themselves. All relationships begin in projection, Hollis reminds us, and that's not all bad. As a young man, Dante spied a girl of nine, Beatrice, on the Ponte Vecchio, and literature and the arts have never been the same again. Such was the strength of his projection. Now, had Dante actually married Beatrice, I'm not sure we would have had the art, but what Dante did do that day was to pick up a mirror and look deeply into his own feminine heart and then project it onto the young girl on that bridge. Hollis warns us that we suffer under the weight of two great fantasies. The first is that we are immortal, and the second is that there is a magical other out there that will make us whole. The search for that other is futile, as futile as the cardinal who pecks at its reflection, but who continues to do it anyway. We go looking for the teeth to match our wounds, the wounds delivered by unconscious parents and peers when we were too young to understand what was going on. Who, Hollis asks, would say, I want to repeat my childhood wounding. I will love you because you are so familiar. But in fact, we do this all the time. It gets even more complicated. Hollis points out that given the erosion of the tribal myths, which once helped connect our ancestors to the gods, one can even suggest that romantic love has replaced institutional religion as the greatest influence in our lives. So, to be clear, the search for love has replaced the search for God for many. We are destined to fall unless we pick up that mirror and find out what is driving us this way or that. The evidence, Hollis says, is strong that there are no magical others, that we befoul our relationships with our own psychic debris, that the best relationship we can ever achieve is a function of the relationship we achieve to ourselves. The most loving thing we can do for those we claim to love and for the world is to withdraw our projections and consciously assimilate them into our personal journey. Pick up this book to find out how to go about retrieving those projections and begin to mend yourself and those you love. It is a journey you'll be glad you took.